with today's speaker. Our guest today is David Spergel. David is an accomplished astrophysicist and emeritus professor at Princeton. In 2016, he became the founding director of the Center for Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute in New York. And he will take over as the president of the Simons Foundation later this year. I think it is fair to say that David knows the cosmic microwave background better than almost any other person. He was one of the lead analyzers of the original data delivered by the WMAP satellite work, which earned him the breakthrough prize in fundamental physics in 2018, which is only one of the many prizes and honors that have been awarded to him. Over the past years, cosmology has increasingly become a precision science. But to fully exploit the large amounts of high quality data, that are available today, new analysis techniques are necessary. In his talk today, David will ask maybe the ultimate question, the question about the initial conditions of the universe. And he will tell us about how machine learning can help to find the answer. David. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be in Oxford, even if only virtually. Um, you know, to, to add to my uh, trajectory, uh, in many ways started at, at Oxford. I spent my first year of graduate school working with James Binney and I was at Merton College and learned a lot about dynamics that year and have had the pleasure of returning a number of times, including spending part of my sabbatical there uh, a number of years ago. Um, today's talk is really, uh, in a sense, a continuation of what was led in that introduction. You know, what much of my middle career was spent on thinking about the microwave background and developing analysis techniques for it. And what I want to talk to you about today is, is in a sense, very much work in progress, a program of thinking about how can we develop the tools we need to fully exploit the information we have on large scale structure. And can we develop the tools we need uh, to do the kind of statistical analysis that the data I think ultimately deserves to be able to extract the maximum amount of information about the initial conditions of the universe and its basic properties. And to sort of give the, the punchline, um, we have tools for doing the forward modeling from initial conditions to observations with some uncertainties already. These tools are numerical simulations of various kinds that are incredibly demanding computationally. And in order to apply them to data, we will need to apply techniques of machine learning to be able to develop ways to accurately approximate this forward model. And I believe with that, we will be able to extract much more from the data than people currently plan and get enormous value. Um, to tell that story, I want to begin, since as a broad audience, by introducing some of the basics of cosmology. And, uh, you know, the, to start with, to give a sense of where the field is, we have found that a remarkably simple model in some ways fits all of our data. We now have, and I'll show you some of the data, measurements at millions of points of the sky in the microwave background, observations of the large scale structure, uh, measurements of the expansion rate of the universe, and with a model that assumes that the same laws of physics that are valid locally are valid throughout the universe through space and time. The total energy of the universe is zero or equivalent, the, the geometry is flat. Um, and has five basic parameters, the age of the universe, the density of atoms, the density of matter, how lumpy the universe is, the amplitude of the power spectrum, and how that lumpiness varies with scale, the slope of the primordial power spectrum. With those five numbers, we can fit all of our observations pretty much. There's some interesting tensions, but that's another talk. Um, so it's a simple and successful model. But it's a strange model because it says that atoms make up only 5% of the universe. Most of the universe is in the form of dark matter, which makes up about the next 25% in dark energy, energy associated with empty space, 
We don't know what the dark matter is. We don't understand the dark energy. We have a basic theory to explain how these fluctuations were generated in the early universe, but that's a very incomplete theory. Um, so we know we're missing lots of physics. We know the physics we're missing is physics that goes beyond the standard model of particle physics. So we know we need new fundamental physics to address this. So we're in a very interesting moment. Um, to explain that, um, you know, we need to go and give you some a basic introduction first to special relativity, right? To remind those who are not used to thinking about cosmology that because the finite speed of light as we look out in space, we look back in time. So our observations of nearby stars, a few uh, light years away, you know, something that's 10 light years away, we see as it was 10 years ago. We see a nearby galaxy as it was a million years ago, a more distant galaxy as it was perhaps a billion years ago. And when we look out and we'll look back in time to the microwave background, we'll see the universe as it was roughly 13.8 billion years ago. And there's my Brexit joke, so we'll move on. The other key um, idea to think about is that we live in an expanding universe. Uh, the picture that I like to have of the expanding universe is to suppress one dimension, to think about the universe as a, a sphere. We live on the surface of the sphere, and the radius of the sphere is time. So the universe is expanding and expanding, getting less and less dense with time. If we run things backwards, as we go back in time, the universe gets denser and denser, hotter and hotter. You can see in this picture as we collapse towards a point that the Big Bang is a moment in time, not a moment in space as in which it collapses down to a point. And if you think about this expanding picture, what you see the universe is expanding into is the future. It's not expanding into some other region of space. It's, it's as time goes forward, the universe gets bigger and less dense. In that, that basic picture, as we go back in time, the universe gets hotter and hotter, denser and denser. When you get back to about 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe gets, gets hot enough that the hydrogen, that's the dominant component for the atoms, becomes fully ionized. And back when the universe was about 1 1,000th its present size, that's what you're measuring with its redshift, the universe underwent a transition from when the universe was ionized to being neutral. So, you know, here's another version of this quick history of the universe. And when we look back at 13.8 billion years at the microwave background, this leftover heat from the Big Bang, we see small fluctuations in the temperature of the universe. And over the past now 30 years, we've been measuring those fluctuations with increasing resolution, first detected with the COBE satellite. I played a, a, a role in the Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe, a NASA built satellite that mapped it at higher resolution. And this past decade, the best results we've had have come from uh, the ESA led Planck satellite that's maps the sky at even higher resolution. And this is a, a version of the Planck data that shows, and with the zoom in, how high a resolution Planck has achieved in mapping the fluctuations across the whole sky. And uh, I'll just quickly flash up because we have some new results. We continue to make these measurements at, high, in, at higher and higher resolution. We've been operating a telescope in Chile that's been um, remapping the same sky uh, now at five times the resolution and more than two times the sensitivity of Planck. And we see the same sky. It's really reassuring to see all these experiments get consistent data, but now with increasing resolution that also lets us see dusty galaxies and clusters, those cold spots on the map are actually clusters of galaxies that we detect as shadows against the background microwave sky. So what do we do with this data? The approach we've taken is basically summarized as we can take the temperature maps, these maps across the sky, we expand them out in spherical harmonics. In this case, and we'll contrast this what, uh, with what we will talk about in the rest of the talk, things are simple. The fluctuations are very well characterized by a Gaussian distribution on these scales. 
We can, uh, the fluctuations are isotropic and seemingly homogeneous. We check that. Um, we can take the fluctuations we see, measure the two point function of the map, and we fit our theory, which we can compute. Those are our five basic parameters. And we ask what's the likelihood of the temperature pattern we see given the parameters in our model. And we get a very good fit. And this is sort of the current state of the art with the different data sets shown, different color points, the Planck experiment in blue, and then a series of recent ground based experiments shown in red, yellow, green, and purple. And we measure not just the temperature two point function, but the two point function of the polarization maps, which we decompose into what we call E modes and B modes, E modes being the pattern of polarization that's symmetric under mirror reflection and B modes, the pattern that's anti-symmetric. And the high level takeaway from this is first the experiments agree, and these are very sensitive measurements, fluctuations at the micro Kelvin level. And second, that we have a theory that fits all the data. And what's, as an aside, a nice ch check on all this is you can fit your theory to say the temperature data alone, and then predict uh, what happens with the temperature and polarization data. And uh, one of the exciting things of having been part of this is, you know, you fit your model one year, a few points seem to be off at the two sigma level, or even sometimes with level of points, some at the three sigma level. The next year, your experimental colleagues have improved the results and the measurements keep going back towards the theory. So uh, uh, it's been, been fun to see that all work out. And with that, we actually have a basic theory of the initial conditions where we uh, gives us a very well-motivated prior that our initial conditions are Gaussian random phase. We can take the density of the universe, expand it out in uh, Fourier modes, and each of these modes are independent with an amplitude drawn by the power spectrum predicted by the theory. And what's shown below is the data. Uh, this is actually pretty old data at this point. This is from WMAP, but it's a plot I like that shows the number of fluctuations of a given temperature um, normalized by the variance on that scale. The, the data shown in the black histogram of Gaussian curve. So there's no, in a sense, no parameters here once you've normalized it by the variance um, is the dash line. And you're looking at the data smoothed on the uh, four degree scale, the one degree scale and the quarter degree scale. And uh, you can see that the fluctuations we observe are very well fit by a Gaussian distribution. So once we've specified, oops, those initial conditions, we can then run it forward in time to make predictions about what the universe should look like today. And this is where things, and I would say, get interesting. because you can see those Gaussian initial fluctuations grow by gravity to become highly nonlinear and highly non-Gaussian. And gravity is the dominant force on these large scales. And as we'll see, as we get to smaller scales, we have to start worrying about hydrodynamics and galaxy formation. So the basic picture here, and this is first, let's begin with that little picture in the corner. When you look at the microwave background, we're looking back in time, we see this early, nearly homogeneous universe. Gravity makes it evolve to a much richer nonlinear universe, has stuff like us in it. Um, and uh, we then on, in the local, local volume, looking at things over just the last four or five billion years, we can trace that with the large scale distribution of galaxies. And this shows a slice of the distribution of galaxies measured in things like the Sloan survey. And while on the largest scales, the approximation that the fluctuations are small, well described by a Gaussian random field seems to remain good, on small scales, the perturbations are nonlinear. And these nonlinear perturbations on very small scales collapse to form what we call dark matter halos, bound galaxies of dark matter. And in these dark matter halos, remember the universe is mostly made of dark matter, uh, baryons, uh, atoms, and electrons and protons represent uh, 
you know, only about uh, a sixth of the gravitating matter that clusters cool, they form stars, they have feedback from, from uh, things like supermassive black holes. And when we actually go to observe galaxies, we're observing the stars in the galaxies. We're observing in some sense, the froth on top of the ocean waves. And we're trying to figure out how do we use our observations of that froth to uh, understand what the underlying distribution of matter is. And our goals in all this, in some ways we characterize, and as I'll use the next few plots, as trying to measure basic parameters in the model, the density of matter, the density of atoms, the expansion rate of the universe, the properties of the initial fluctuations, also other parameters in the model. What is the mass of the neutrino? What are some of the properties of dark energy? Do we see um, new particles? And the reason why we want to measure these parameters is, you know, this lets us get at some really fundamental questions about the basic properties of the universe. Uh, so for me, this is the ultimate kind of my ultimate motivation in thinking about these problems and applying the, as we'll see soon, the tools of machine learning is we want to better be able to answer these questions. Um, and again, to give you a sense of where we are right now, what is the standard in the field is to do the same thing with the large scale structure to take uh, a survey like the Sloan survey. And here's a, a paper from 2021 measuring the two point correlation function. So just measure the two point statistic and take most of what we can out of that. Um, they, uh, in this case, they, you know, we do some nonlinear, some corrections for how structure grows. They show here they're applying this reconstruction technique that Dan Eisenstein and uh, Ed Serko and uh, Hiyu Sung and I developed a number of years ago, many years ago, um, to this uh, data to improve our ability to learn a bit more about the information, but it's it's all kind of, it's all linear theory applied. We're not doing anything very sophisticated right now. And, you know, the question that we want to ask is if we go from the observations to the theory, what's the tool we want to use? For the microwave background, we knew the right thing to do. We knew that all the information was encoded in the two-point function, so we just measured that and fit that. Um, we felt for a long time there's much more information than what's in the two-point function. And the challenge is how do we extract it? And the first step in that is understanding just what are the summary statistics that we want to use to determine these basic parameters with the smallest errors. And now I think is the time to address this question. And that's because we're in the midst of this incredible explosion of data that's going to happen in the next few years. Uh, the dark energy survey is underway, sur a, a much bigger survey than the Sloan galaxy survey. That's those spectroscopic surveys of galaxy positions I showed it will be improved enormously. The Vera Rubin Observatory is going to begin surveying the sky next year. We will have uh, much deeper images, which will give us measurements of the distribution of matter through gravitational lensing and like. The European Space Agency is launching the Euclid satellite, which will uh, map much of the sky now uh, from space, so it, with improved image quality. And NASA, a, few, a couple of years later, and this is a mission I've been deeply involved with, is going to launch the Roman Space Telescope, and that will map eventually the entire sky with the resolution of the Hubble telescope. Um, and in addition, and it will be operating in the infrared, which will let us peer deeper into the universe. In addition to these optical and infrared surveys, uh, the German-Russian collaboration has launched uh, Erosita, which is an X-ray satellite that is mapping the whole sky as we speak. And we're continuing to improve our microwave background maps. One of the big projects that we're involved with at the Simons Foundation is the construction of the Simons Observatory, which will be mapping the microwave sky at significantly higher resolution and sensitivity. So we're about to measure all this wonderful data. 
my experimental and observational colleagues are uh, doing terrific work. And I think, you know, and I feel that as theorists, what people have been doing is basically applying the tools that uh, Jim Peebles and others developed in the 1960s to measure the two-point correlation function to this incredibly rich data. And we'd like to know, well, first, is there more information there? And one of the techniques we want to do to this is take a series of observables and just ask, can we extract more information from this? So an approach we took to do this was uh, to compute the Fisher matrix of the parameters given the observables. And uh, the way we computed this was we threw a lot of computer time at it. It's good to be director of a computational astrophysics institute. So we ran, this is work led by uh, Francesco Venezuela Navarro, uh, who goes by Paco. And uh, what Paco did or led a group that launched 43,000 uh, full end body simulations like the one you showed, uh, sampling over 7,000 cosmologies. This produced a data set of about 50 trillion particles over a volume larger than the entire observable universe. In these simulations, we've identified billions of halos and voids. It took 35 million CPU hours and generated a petabyte of data. And I'm advertising this because all this data is available. So if anyone wants to play with and train on um, cosmological end body data, which is what we want to do ourselves, um, we've, uh, all this is available for people to use and download and interact with. Um, we have a team of people who have been looking at this data, uh, really at this point spread out uh, uh, throughout the world, looking at different pieces of it and have uh, extracted lots of information, interesting information from it. Um, I'm going to highlight uh, a, a few of the results. So one of the things we looked at was, is there more information there? And first, what information can we measure on these basic parameters, like the density of atoms, the expansion rate, the Hubble constant, and so on from the power spectrum? And we extract the information from the two-point functions that we expect. And what we discover is we start adding additional statistics like the halo mass functions, the numbers of voids. We try different summary statistics. As we add more summary statistics, the amount of information we get improves. And um, one way to quantify the value of this is to say, we've built these big experiments. We're spending billions of dollars on these satellites motivated partially by measuring these parameters. Um, improving the parameters by uh, by factors two or five, as we sometimes do, is equivalent to getting four times or twenty-five times more data, which you know is another multi-billion-dollar investment. So it, there's, I would argue, significant, almost you know, certainly scientific value, but we can even quantify in a sense the the return on investment. Uh, uh, that one gets from applying these new statistical techniques. And we've looked at uh, a number of statistics and uh, uh, particularly promising one in improving parameters is taking the, um, the density field and using mark density field statistics. And uh, we, we, you know, the real takeaway here on these different approaches, and this is just a number of papers showing different ways of, of cutting the data, different techniques, is that there seems to be uh, an incredible richness in the data that we've not extracted. Now, why haven't we done that so far? One of the reasons is that while these dark matter simulations are great, we actually know there's much more underlying physics. And to give a, a sense of that, let me show you this simulation from the illustrious TNG team that includes not only dark matter physics, but gas cooling, star formation feedback, uh, the density of baryons. And you can see that when you look at the, the distribution now on the scale um, uh, here of galaxies, so the bar in the corner shows 100 kiloparsecs. So we're looking on the scale of about a megaparsec, roughly the distance between us and Andromeda in these simulations. And when you get down to the galaxy scale, um, 
there's much richer physics than gravity. And included in all these simulations, and this is the state of, I would say the current state of the art in many ways, is um, lots of approximations. So you can see in the right-hand corner, uh, for example, the gas radial velocity as it's forming, and you can see lots of turbulent motions. You can see winds from explosions, I guess you just saw an explosion in the right-hand corner, from supernovae and from uh, active galactic nuclei, jets driven out from supermassive black holes, having big effects on the environment. And these are all things we treat with very approximate subgrid physics that we know um, do not fully capture what's going on. So we, we know when we get to these small scales, um, small scales here are millions of light years, um, we're only getting approximate descriptions of the physics. So if we want to use statistics that go beyond the applying the two-point function on the largest scales where gravity is the dominant force, we need to have ways to marginalize over those uncertainties. And a, a way to get a sense of that, those uncertainties, is this is a pair of simulations uh, run with the, on the right-hand side, that the current best version of the code, the left-hand side, an earlier version with a, a different treatment of the underlying physics. And you can see initially on large, you know, on the largest scales, things broadly agree as these simulations evolve forward in time. But as we get closer and closer to the present time and nonlinear structures become more apparent, there starts to be some differences in detail, depending on what's happening on small scales. And if the approach I'm using is to trace this structure with galaxies, you'll notice that the number of galaxies on the left and the number of galaxies on the right are different. So that the things like void statistics and two point statistics will be a bit different in one box than the other. And this really represents um, our uncertainties in the underlying physics. And any approach that we want is going to have to marginalize over these uncertainties if we're going to want to understand things. And we, uh, to me, this is the approach we want to take is can we marginalize over that? And the broad question that we're trying to address, and this is, I'll go through some of the results we have, but this is very much work in progress as part of a big program, is can we extract all the information from these observed fields? We actually observe the galaxy field, we observe through lensing the large scale distribution of matter, we can observe the large scale distribution of pressure through our microwave background observations. Our X-ray observations tell us more about the distribution of hot gas. So we have lots of observations. Can we extract more information from this? How can we do this? And uh, the work I'm talking about today um, has really been led out of uh, two of my colleagues at the Flatiron Institute, uh, Shirley Ho, uh, who is the group leader for our machine learning and cosmology group, and uh, Francesco Villescuela Navarro, who's uh, now at Princeton uh, working on this. And uh, what I want to talk about is a few pieces of this problem of how we try to make this into a, a more tractable problem to treat statistically by improving our ability to forward model quickly, marginalize over the baryon physics. And I must admit, I am a convert to applying machine learning to this problem. To me, as initially a complete outsider, this seemed uh, magical and I didn't quite understand what was coming out. And I, in the last several years, have learned more and more. Um, but what got me interested was work that uh, C.U. He, a student of Shirley Ho at Carnegie Mellon, where she was at the time, um, did on making faster predictions for these numerical simulations. And early on, I showed these movies showing how structure grew under gravity. And the question they asked was, could they learn or train a network to reproduce the behaviors of these gravitational sim simulations much quicker? And the first step in this was to start with an analytical approximation 
that gave us a pretty good description on the largest scales. And then train the network to uh, on the difference between the analytical approximation, which is fast, and the numerical simulation, which is slow. And, and see you train the network. And this shows uh, the difference in error between the UNET errors. And uh, here the errors are quantified in terms of displacements and megaparsec and the best analytical approximations we have at the moment that on the scales of galaxies and clusters, and particularly in the dense regions, which are those red regions here, the errors in position will often be of order five megaparsecs. While uh, the UNET was able to reduce the errors by you know, nearly an order of magnitude. We can quantify that, or they quantified that, by looking at the power spectrum of the simulations and the correlation between the, uh, the exact solution, the numerical gravitational simulation, and the predictions of the, the UNET. And what's shown in oh, the labels, I lost the labels on this plot. Okay, sorry. Uh, what's shown in orange is the truth what comes out of the end body simulation. What's shown in green is, excuse me, green is the truth. What's shown in orange is what comes out of the UNET and blue, what was the state of the art. And you can see that the UNET does a much better job at reconstructing the, the power spectrum. It can reconstruct things down to wave numbers of about 0.5 quite accurately. And uh, the beauty of running things with the UNET is that once you've trained the network, it, it is now 60 million times faster at forward modeling than running the end body code. So it lets us start to think about doing things in terms of evaluating likelihoods of nonlinear non Gaussian statistics that we couldn't imagine doing if we had to forward model with an end body code each piece of it. And we continue to improve on this. And this is some recent work done by Renan de Lovera and Yin Li, who uh, Renan was a visiting student from Brazil here at Flatiron. Yin Li is a, a, a postdoc here where they have um, improved on the performance of the networks, um, improved, made improvements in architecture, and now are, uh, have pushed uh, in scale from wave numbers of 0.5 to wave numbers of one uh, in terms of the scales in which we can accurately reproduce the results of the end body code. Because the amount of uh, the number of modes we measure goes as wave number cubed or in 3D, a factor two improvement in the scales we can simulate in a sense represents a factor eight improvement in uh, the effective uh, mass resolution over which we can uh, reproduce results. And what's intriguing, and I think this rests on the fact that the analytical approximation captures the large scale behavior, and there's some scale invariant behavior that's uh, being learned by the network. And we are uh, very much work in progress to understand why this performs so well, is we've trained the network on a universe with a matter density of about 0.3. We've then taken the same network, the same unit trained at 0.3 and applied it to universes with much higher or much lower density. And we find that we get very good performance, even though the network was trained on a very different, on a different cosmological model. And uh, my hypothesis on this is what the network is learning, is how to take the kind of fuzzy structures that come out of the analytical approximation um, and make them sharper to go back to this picture. On the left, you can see things look kind of fuzzy. And what the network learns to do is make fuzzy things sharp. And as long as the analytical approximation gets the fuzzy things approximately right, the CNN is learning to do local corrections to make the 
the details right. Uh, I think an important part of the physical structure of our problem is that it, on large scales, we have a successful analytical theory. On small scales is where the nonlinearities are. So we want our networks to, to learn how to capture the small scale behavior. Now, you have to remember I'm a cosmologist. So a million light years counts as, as small scales. So this motivates us to really think about a whole program which we've embarked of, of can we go from initial conditions to the results of a dark matter simulation from forward modeling? Can we learn how to go from the dark matter simulation to compare it to simulations that capture the full astrophysics that often take months of supercomputer time? So we can learn how to go from dark matters to galaxy and gas, then think about model how to go from the simulations of the distribution of galaxies and gas to the observations, to be able to make comparison to the observations, then either think of mod forward modeling the whole thing and applying likelihood free inference or techniques of that sort, or think about the inverse problem and ask if we can iteratively um, work our way from observations back to initial conditions. And this, some sense, single simple figure conveys uh, a big program that a, a number of us have embarked on with many people working on various pieces of this problem. Another way of quantifying this, if I think about this in terms of a, a, a likelihood function is asking, can I compute the likelihood of the data I observe? And this is what conveying data from you know, D here is might be data from our microwave background experiment. D prime is our data from our large scale structure experiment. We want to marginalize over all possible amplitudes, marginalize over our uncertainties in the astrophysics, marginalize over our uncertainties in observational systematics, ask what the likelihood of the amplitude are given the parameters, where I have my various priors on uh, parameters the astrophysics and the observational systematics. And um, it's easy to write down this integral. It's pretty challenging to uh, evaluate. Uh, we need to model a volume of uh, about 10 to the 11 megaparsecs cubed. So that integral over initial amplitudes is in a sense an integral over 10 to the nine to 10 to the 10 variables. Every evaluation of that forward modeling means going from initial conditions to the observed galaxy distribution. When we do that forward modeling, we need to uh, marginalize over uncertainties in the astrophysics. Ultimately, we need to project into the observational plane and include systematic effects. So the next step in terms of developing tools to do this was uh, Paco, Shai Junel, and Daniel Angel. The czar um, embarked on a new suite of simulations we call the CAMEL simulations. They launched basically the same number of and body and hydro simulations. The hydro simulations use two independently developed hydro codes with different realizations of the underlying physics. The illustrious TNG code using the Arepo system uh, code developed by Volker Springle and Lars Hernquist, and the Gizmo and, and Symbol codes developed by Ramil Dave, who's known Edinburgh and his collaborators, um, together with the underlying Gadget 3 code for, the, for gravity. So we had sort of dark matter only simulations. We have dark matter only simulations. We have hydro simulations with one set of codes. We have hydro simulations with the other set of codes. Our hope is that the difference between the two hydro simulations is of order the difference between the hydro simulation and the real universe, or at least gives us a sense of some of a piece of the uncertainty, which is actually very hard to, to quantify is um, how does different treatments of physics, how does that affect our uncertainties? And we've uh, you know, generated large numbers of simulations with the goals of providing theory predictions for the summary statistics, uh, training neural nets to be able to extract information, marginalize over the baryon 
physics and learn how to go from the and body simulations, which are expensive, but not as expensive as the hydro simulations, to the hydro simulations with full baryonic effects. And really our goal is to be able to go uh, have a neural net or pair, sets of nets take us from initial conditions to what would be the results of gravity only to what are the results of a full baryonic simulation. And have it exploring things in this way lets us quantify the dependence of galaxy formation and evolution on astrophysical and cosmological parameters. In a way, this is a very different, a bit of a different spirit from the approach people have usually taken to galaxy formation simulations where they want to fit the best model to the data. Here, our goal is really to fit, to evaluate what is the uncertainty in the predictions of the model, given that uh, we don't know all the astrophysical parameters. So as we vary the simulations, and this just shows for example, how the hydro power spectrum on the right compares to the dark matter power spectrum as we vary cosmological astrophysical parameters. So what do we mean vary astrophysical parameters? We vary things like what is the energy that supernova put in to the gas around them? If you remember those explosions driving gas out, we vary the amplitude of the parameter that describes that energy input. And as we vary those parameters, um, the different models have different effects on the power spectrum. And this shows the variation in the matter. Power spectrum is a function of scale. And you'll notice that the range in scale now goes to much smaller scales that we've talked about earlier. Um, K equals one is now on the left. That's the sort of small scales of the earlier plots. And you can see on those scales, one of the things we learn is that the corrections due to hydrodynamics are at the percent level. Well, when we get to much smaller scales, a factor 10 smaller in scale, um, wave numbers of order 10 uh, in megaparsecs, the corrections are now at the 20 or 30 percent level. And this shows it get just pairs of simulations done with different codes with the same initial conditions, again, giving us a measure of, of some of those variations. And here's the two different codes evolving the universe forward. And of course, they, you know, they broadly agree on the large scale and differ on the small scales. And one of the things we want to do is capture that difference. So again, the sort of dream here is to have these thousands of cosmologies simulated with dark matter only, and with Quixote, thousands of astrophysical models. We're developing some super resolution techniques so we can improve the range and then find ways to marginalize over the baryon effects. And let me give you a sense of some of the pieces we've been working on in this. And uh, this is uh, some of the team that's been uh, contributing to various pieces of this to look at the mappings between the n body sims and the hydro. Uh, here's some work done by uh, Leander Thiel, who's a graduate student at Princeton. And here the approach he's taken is asking, can we learn from these camel simulations how to go from dark matter only to the distribution of gas? Can we predict the electron pressure, the electron density, and the electron momentum given what the dark matter with gravity only simulations predict. And the approach we've taken, which um, I think we found for a lot of these problems has been a successful, is to start with analytical models that get us part of the way there. And that to train the network, not on going from the dark matter simulation to the simulations of the gas physics, but to go to train the model to, to uh, take the dark matter simulations, take an analytical approximation to predict what the gas does, and train the network on the difference between the analytical approximation and what the gas does. And this turns out to be very valuable in a problem like this because we have a very, the key parameter in determining the gas properties for a cluster is the mass of a cluster. And rather than having to train um, 
the network on a very wide range of masses um, and sample that mass distribution very carefully, we can train the, the network um, to learn the correction to the analytical theory as a function of scale. And one of the challenges in this problem is if when we look at the large scale distribution of gas, this shows the in blue the, the PDF of the gas pressure as a function of scale. And you can see that the typical pixel, a typical voxel in the simulation has very low pressure. And the, um, there's only a tiny fraction of the volume in the very high pressure regions. The observations measure the integrated pressure. So they care primarily about the highest pressure dense regions, yet our simulations are not doing a very good job of sampling the most run a series of zoom simulations, multi-scale high resolution simulations, where we sample the tail much better. So we create, and the, what we actually use for our training is the gas bloom distribution that shows that much of our simulation time and volume and training set goes to simulations that are the extreme cases, which are the ones we care about observationally. So you've got to train not equal volume, but train um, on equal importance. And uh, this shows our ability to recover parameters. Uh, black here represents the power spectrum of the, um, so what we've done is we train the network on these small camel simulations we have, with lots of small boxes. We now apply it to, uh, for testing to a much larger scale simulation, the actual, the big illustrious T and G simulations that are now um, available uh, from the illustrious team. And black shows the predictions from their simulation. Orange shows as we've trained the network to go from dark matter to prediction, how well we do. And the blue represents the analytical theory, which gets close, but doesn't quite capture what goes on. And the plot on the right shows the one point PDF and shows that we're capturing a lot of the basic parameters. Um, I'm running a little late, so let me move quickly. We've also looked at how we go from dark matter to galaxies and can match the large scale distribution of galaxies. So we're working on a program of being able to make predictions for surveys like the Euclid survey for the large scale galaxy distribution. The next piece of the problem um, that we've you know, begun working on, and this is some work that uh, Chirag Modi has been uh, pioneering is the inverse problem, which is assume we know we have the right forward model. Can we then invert it and recover the initial conditions? And uh, what's shown on the left is um, his efforts to take uh, the sort of a current inference uh, machine approach approach, um, make a cosmological version of it, and uh, compare its ability to recover initial conditions. And uh, right now, this is working well, but on a very small box, a 64 cube box was what we can fit the GPU. And uh, this compares the truth to the reconstructed model. And you can see both in um, and we've also looked at doing the reconstruction, not on just on the dark matter fields, but also assuming it is being sampled as a galaxy distribution. And on the right shows the ability of RIM to do this inverse problem, and it's outperforming uh, kind of an optimized, an atom optimized approach, and pushing out to reasonably small wave numbers. We're, you know, Chirag is still working to understand well what sets the limitation of this reconstruction um, and can one push this to smaller scales. Also, there's a, another challenge for this problem is this is still being done in very small boxes compared to the scales we would need to be able to apply this to uh, cosmological surveys. So we, we have a number of thoughts on how to generalize this. 
So let me give you a summary of what I tried to convey. Um, the question we're trying to answer is, can we extract more information about the fundamental properties of a universe from cosmological observations than we're doing currently? I think the answer is emphatic yes. In fact, with these new surveys coming, I think we're almost obligated having asked the taxpayers to pay billions of dollars to build telescopes and satellites and the like that uh, we extract all the information's there. And it's clear that what there's information that we've been missing that's uh, in these other summary statistics. Uh, I think to apply these summary statistics to the data, it's gonna require that we develop techniques for extracting all the information that requires uh, very fast ways of simulating the universe and then marginalizing over the astrophysical uncertainties. It's a bit, you know, just a, a more sophisticated way of doing our statistics and that uh, machine learning is gonna be a key piece of this effort. And, uh, you know, I'm a, we're very much approaching this as, um, you know, users of uh, machine learning, not uh, so much as tech developers of techniques, but as often true when you really are pushing something to do a demanding problem, you will hopefully in the end also do things that will lead to insights um, into the underlying techniques and approaches. So let me stop there. Thank you for listening and uh, take questions. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for this excellent talk. Very, very interesting. Okay, we have time for a few questions. If you want to ask a question, then just please raise your hand and I will have to actively unmute you to be able to speak. I, I think I have the privilege of speaking without raising a hand. Um, I, I typed a long question in the in the chat, and I but it's maybe easier to to explain it. So this very wonderful talk you give displays a pattern that we've discussed in the seminar mm -hmm. where machine learning is a so-called surrogate for scientific simulation. Mm -hmm. The surrogate means it's much faster and allows one to explore spaces, not, uh, spaces in the parameter space not previously explored. Um, I think the most profound example we heard about this was from Lawrence Livermore Laboratory that looked at fusion mm -hmm. in an oval instead of a sphere. They had never been able to, you know, consider a different shape than a sphere. The sphere is round, it should be the best, and it wasn't. Yeah, uh, which was discovered by applying the surrogate first and then confirming it with the traditional simulation. Now, I think you mentioned some great opportunities for this particular surrogate to make a transformational change in this research. Could you repeat that or articulate that just a little further? Because I think that that's sort of the center point of the interaction between computation and astrophysics here. Right. So let me actually generalize and talk about some things I didn't talk about in terms of opportunities. So the one I want to focus on today was in a sense this version you've talked about of what I want out of machine learning is the ability to do calculations faster that I couldn't do before. And it's just the fact that I can do these calculations. Um, it's an approximate, in a way it's um, using it as a, uh, an efficient way to do interpolation in a high dimensional space that I sample with uh, very expensive numerical simulations and that lets me do this, address these questions. Um, and our goal in doing this is to, in this case, to get at fundamental properties of the universe. What's the mass of the neutrino? Um, there's other pieces that we've been thinking about, which I think are you know, really sub subjects of completely different talks. Um, can we use it to do multi-scale physics in ways we haven't done before, right? So, and, and that's something that's actually hidden in this talk that I have not addressed, which is, all right, can we uh, take a problem like turbulence where we can only simulate a certain dynamic range? And the, there's a lot of MHD turbulence and things like that going on when we get to the galaxy formation scale. Can the neural net actually learn 
better descriptions of multi-scale physics? Can it learn closer relationships that we haven't seen before? And um, uh, there's a group of people here at Flatiron who've been looking at both 2D and 3D turbulence to see if we can uh, effectively learn, learn new physics. And there's a kind of a, a branch with that where one looks at um, applying this in ways in which you can actually try to get better, um, learn actual, you know, and new analytical expressions that better capture it. So I think there's, the, there's an, another piece of the story in terms of things we've been thinking about that I just want to throw out there besides uh, the story I told today, which is really um, using machine learning to do things uh, that we know how to, in a sense, know how to do already, but can't do fast enough, which to be, to be able to get the full advantage of the data, which is what I'm focused on today. Yeah, so, so you know, I think you're hinting with the uh, multi-scale physics at what you need to do with a student like machine learning. You need to drag this student to make great discoveries in science. And that's, you know, for us to learn how to train these students well beyond the mechanical training on data is I think a really great challenge. Yeah. I, I, I think it's a great question. Um, that's up me. Uh, next yes. visit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you will come in person then, I hope. You know, as soon as they let me into the country without quarantining, I'll visit. <laughs> Excellent. Fantastic. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, Raymond, you have a question. I've got my, my, my vaccination pass. It's, the people aren't accepting it yet. Oh, yes, yeah, so are you okay? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, good, yes. Hi, yes, I re really enjoy that. It's, it's interesting that the similarity of, of your program for cosmology to what various people in climate want to do with machine learning is very striking. Uh, whereas your headache is baryotic matter, our, our headache is clouds. Yes. Uh, the, the, um, uh, with the cloud problem, uh, we have the problem the clouds feed back extremely strongly on the equivalent of dark matter on the large scale hydrodynamic uh, cir uh, circulation. And so I was wondering in terms of the structure of the problem, something that wasn't clear to me coming at this field from the outside, does the baryonic matter formation uh, that uh, process, does that, does that feedback very strongly on the dark matter distribution or is it more a matter of, of uh, your needing to go from the, the dark matter distribution to, to say what the baryonic matter is doing embedded in all of that? The feedback, the importance of the feedback is very much scale dependent. So on the scale of a galaxy, so uh, thousands of parsecs, it's an, the feedback effects are very large order unity change in the dark matter distribution you have. On the scale of a cluster, a million parsecs, it's significant. But the typical gas motions are of order, a gas particle will move of order a million parsecs, three million light years in the age of the universe. So um, it will change things a lot on that scale. But if I go to the scale of five megaparsecs, it's all motions that are uh, small compared to that. So what it will do is change the quadrupole moment of the distribution of matter that will then affect yeah. things on large scales. So as you get to larger and larger scales, it becomes a perturbative correction. So, yeah. and in a sense, what I, you know, one way of viewing the, this marginalization over uncertainty problem is to say, I know all it's doing on this larger scale is changing the quadrupole a bit. The quadrupole is gonna, I can learn that it is changing within this range of values. And that's what I wanna marginalize over in evaluating my uncertainty. So there's, because of, um, basically because of mass conservation and momentum conservation, when I look at what happens on one scale, on, one odd region here, the fact um, the change in gravitational change over here is at most a quadrupole. The monopole and dipole terms are, un are zero because I can't move matter. So that actually makes things converge 
on the sort of five mega to 10 megaparsec scale. Okay, actually, I, uh, that, what you said uh, reminded me of a follow-up question. So in, in, uh, in a lot of the things that people are trying to do with clouds, they've, they've had the problem that the standard machine learning algorithms don't make it easy to impose physical priors like conservation of the mass of water, conservation of angular momentum, things like that. So in, in your approach to the application of machine learning, are you actually able to uh, impose certain physical priors um, or, uh, or, or does the machine learning algorithm have to learn those things that you already know are true? It, you know, we're doing a bunch of problems. So there's a bunch of different things we found valuable. Um, if, um, we've often used equivariant networks that um, express in the network structure, the underlying symmetry of the physics. Um, and uh, so that's been one approach. Um, Another um, in these cosmological problems, as I mentioned, what's been powerful to use is the fact that we often have approximate analytical descriptions that get you much of the way there. And using that step has been, been helpful. Um, Great. Yeah. Thanks. I, I'm. Uh, we. You know. It's always this question in numerical systems, right? Do you use your conservation? Do you impose your conservation laws or use them as a check on your final result? Yeah. And one of the things we've been talking about is an important thing we know about the universe is it's um, homogeneous and isotropic. And the when we get to the end of the day and project this compared to the observations, the observations are, um, the observations make things inhomogeneous. Certain parts of the sky you have more data on because it's been less cloudy on Earth. So you were able to get more data when your telescope pointed in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, there are, because we measure things not in three physical dimensions, but we're affected by galaxy motions, the observations are anisotropic. Now we understand in our forward model how to capture that. When we go back to recover initial conditions, the approach we've been thinking of, and this is really very much work in progress, is to use um, our knowledge that things, that the universe ought to look isotropic and homogeneous. And if, my reconstructed initial conditions um, all point towards me. Um, there's something called uh, uh, the finger of God effect, which was uh, identified by Fritz Zwicky, the original discoverer of dark matter back in the 30s. And as uh, Margaret Geller taught me when I was a graduate student, uh, Zwicky used to go run around and say, look at all those fingers of God pointing at you, telling you that you were wrong. And uh, I think at the end of the day, when we do this reconstruction, if we find fingers of God pointing us at our initial conditions, that's telling us we're wrong. And I, I'm at the moment preferring to use the, some of the symmetries that we know as a test on our, um, the effectiveness of our approximation and models rather than imposing them through the mapping. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. We have one more question, uh, which is by Martin. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I appreciate the progression from the kind of fairly general to the very specific questions. Um, I was a bit curious about, you know, you repeated many times you're trying to use your, your very impressive suite of simulations to, to recover the physics, in particular the baryonic physics. Um, and if I understood well, the way you do this, of course, is to essentially map the observation onto specific simulations where that physics was implemented, you know, in a specific way. So uh, if I understood that right, then aren't you worried that in fact in those simulations, the physics was parameterized, if you want, very, very crudely. I mean, often with really barely any physics at all, uh, often with in fact entirely empirical so-called laws like, like the schmidt kennicott law, for example. Mm -hmm. So are you worried that what you'll recover is you know, the best recipe, but that in itself, you won't learn any physics from that because there wasn't much physics to start with in those recipes. Um, yes. 
Um, but my hope is um, that if we're in, you know, so let me talk in particular about the things like the schmidt kennicott law as a parameterization. So this is a parameterization that treats, relates the surface density of gas in the disk to the star formation rate. And um, that then relates to how much energy is put back in feedback. I think it's gonna be very difficult to, uh, to extract cosmological information on scales smaller than a megaparsec, a million parsecs. And all the details of star formation matter a lot on those small scales. But I think by, I, I like to think about it as marginalization, that if I'm interested in what's happening on the five megaparsec scale, if I can vary the Astro, my astrophysics over a plausible region of parameters. And it is a parameterization, but if it does capture the range of responses, then that may turn out to be enough. Particularly if I can calibrate this with some of the observations. So the observations for this particular problem I've been quite interested in is our measurements of the distribution of electrons around galaxy halos. So one of the things we've been doing, we have a a paper out led by Stefano Amadeo on this a couple months ago. Um, so this is part of our observational program is we've been cross correlating the large scale distribution of galaxies with observations of the microwave background, measuring what's called the kinematics and Yale Sobovich effect. For those of you who aren't cosmologists, we basically means we can measure the electron galaxy cross correlation. Remember one of the key uncertainties is how the winds drive out the electrons, how the winds blow out electrons and protons. The different parameterizations of how the underlying physics of the winds will give us different distributions. What we care about is the overall distribution of matter. And because what changes the matter distribution is when you blow out the winds, that changes how matter is distributed. If we can calibrate our models so that they basically say we're only interested in you know, we put it in our likelihood. We're only, we want models that reproduce the right electron galaxy distribution. Um, that will restrict us to, if I think about the parameter, various parameterizations, um, a submanifold of parameters of things like supernova energy injection, uh, star formation efficiencies, and the Kennecott Schmidt laws, um, and so on, that are consistent with the data. And the approach we've taken in the CAMEL simulations is we've actually explored a range of astrophysical parameters that are actually much broader than people usually do in the simulations. You know, we, we, we put in models that have more wind energy than it, we know is there and, much, and less wind energy we know is there. So at least we can understand some of the dependencies. Um, and, you know, this is, uh, you know, this lets us handle the, the known unknowns. Uh, what's always uh, haunts us is the unknown unknowns. Fair enough, thank you. Wonderful, thanks indeed. Thanks a lot, David, for this great talk. Thanks a lot to people who have asked questions. That's it for today. Uh, talk to you again in Trinity term. See you then. Thanks. <laughs>